Well, are you ready for God's Word this morning on this Labor Day weekend? You see, I believe something special happens on holiday weekends because you're not at the beach. And if you're not at the beach, I think God has a little extra for you today. So I am, I am trusting God for the little extra in your life. So open your Bibles, the book of Mark, Mark's Gospel. Uh, as you're turning there, we're in Mark chapter 9. If you've been with us in 2023, your digital device probably has fingerprints on Mark or your Bible just opens there immediately because we've been doing this since January. And yes, we're only to chapter 9, but we, we will finish someday. But God has been using this ministry, this time in the book of Mark to reestablish in us a love for the Jesus of the Bible, an understanding of who he is, an understanding of what he does, an understanding of what he is doing today as we, we recommit our hearts to what it is to be biblical followers of Christ. I also want to say I love First Sundays because on First Sunday, after the service, we have on-ramp. If you're new here at Hope, you've been here a little bit, or even if it's your first day, we do this the first Sunday of every month, and basically we, we go back to another room after service, and, uh, and we feed you, and, and I, I get to share the vision of Hope with you. We get to answer questions. We get some really good questions in these times. I've been asked whether we're Armenian or Calvinist, and y'all are like, what? I know. Uh, we, we've been asked we're pre-trip, you know, all these things. I even got asked if hamsters are going to be in heaven. If it looks like a rodent, I don't think so. That's just my opinion. But we, we come and we talk about what makes us a body of Christ, and we ask you to engage with us. And then we get to do First Wednesday, come out Wednesday night, time of praise and worship. It's an amazing time of prayer. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to be sharing today, and we're going to be looking at verses 30 to 37, but I've got to bring you into the story because, again, we need to approach the Word of God with a curiosity that says, God, where do, we, where do we find ourselves in this? If all we do is look at it as a story, as a historical event, then we go home unchanged. But we are curious, and we say, Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. Lord, let me, let me be changed today because of your word. I can guarantee you he will do just that. So in this story we're in, it's, it's a time where Jesus has, has turned in his story from calling the disciples and, and revealing to them that he is the Messiah. He came with signs and wonders, power and might. He taught like none other. But there was a point where he says, but guys, I'm going to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer and die and how many know that's not what the disciples wanted to hear? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't the God they were looking for, but how many know we get the God we get, not always the God we are looking for? Because so often we create this image of God in our own image, and we think somehow we want that. I don't know about you, but I don't want a God that can do what Mike can do. I want a God that can do exceedingly abundantly, abundantly above all I could ask or imagine. And so now we're into this part where they're, they're journeying toward Jerusalem, and I can only imagine the conversations. You know, they kind of fall back as they're walking, and they're like, hey, what did he mean by that? You know, what is he doing in this? I mean, at this point, they've seen the Jesus heal the deaf and watch them be able to hear for the first time. They've seen him heal the blind and, and, and see people be able to see this creation for the first time. He's driven out demons. He's raised the dead. He's taught them about the kingdom of heaven, and yet they still didn't get it. So can, can that be hope for somebody today? They're, they're sometimes like, why am I the only one struggling with this? Trust me, in our humanity, we, we must struggle. We must press in because there's things about God that we have to look at and say, that doesn't line up with logic but yet God is supernatural and God does what God wants to do. And we thank him for that because, again, he can do more than we can ask. You see, they needed their ears open. They needed their eyes open to understand who, who he really was. Oh, the religious establishment, they, they'd already pegged him. They had said, oh, he's, he's demonic. He's doing his miracles by demon power. They were, they were looking for ways to get rid of him. In fact, it was the religious establishment that demanded more signs. And Jesus said to them what he would say to us today, I'm not playing any games, <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to play your game, and if you want me to prove something, I've already proven it by what I've done and who I am. And he made it clear that he was, he was coming not to set up earthly rule, somebody. He wasn't coming to make Israel great again. He wasn't coming to, to, to hearken them back to their history, to reestablish their glory days. Sometimes we miss out on the fresh move of the Holy Spirit because we're trying to get back to something we experienced before. The good old days are just old, and they weren't that good. Study history. 
We, we, we hearken back to these times that never existed, and we must remind ourselves that the kingdom of God is expanding. The kingdom of God is always moving forward. So he, he made it clear, I didn't come to set up earthly rule. I didn't come to kick out the Romans, and I didn't come to make your lives better. I came to die. And the first time he said that, the disciples rebuked him. Peter rebuked him. Jesus, no. No, that, that's not the Messiah we're looking for. That's not the God we signed up for. He, in fact, he tried to talk him out of it. And if you remember the story, Jesus had a, a word for Peter, and it's not a word that he wanted to hear. He said, get behind me what? Satan, right? That's, that's not a tag you want, right? So, so then he talked to me. He says, look, guys, you got to deny yourself. you got to take up your cross. you got to follow me. Last week we looked as he took them up on the mountain, and he was transfigured. And it taught us something so critical to us today, and that is that Jesus will never be a part of your life. He will never be a part of your life. Oh, he'll have all your life, but he will not take just a part of it. He is not only Savior, he is Lord, and we have to reconcile that in our lives and say, have we just added him as some kind of add-on to our lives, or is he all of it? Because he's never going to be just a part of it. In fact, he made it very clear that he won't settle there. He won't be part of our show. He didn't come just to, to make us uh, great. He, made, he came to reveal that our God is great, and the greatest need we had we met on the cross at Calvary. And now they come down the mountain, and they're, they're going back into the area where the other disciples are waiting, and Jesus finds himself walking into chaos. How many know that Jesus will walk into your chaos? When he walks into your chaos, he brings something that you need, and that is he brings peace. But not only does he bring peace, he brings his power. Just a little, as we're entering into the story, there was, there was a father down below, and, and there was, they were arguing with the disciples. In fact, the whole village had come out, and there was this chaos. And it all revolved around the fact that the father brought his son to be delivered, and the disciples couldn't do it. He was, he was, he'd been tormented by a demon. The, the word of God says the demon would throw the boy into the fire and, the, and into, the, into the water and would try to destroy his life. Guys, never forget that our enemy, the devil, seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. He, he, he doesn't come just to give us a hard time. He seeks to kill, steal, and destroy, according to John 10.10. 10. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life to the full. And the father's there standing before Jesus, and I, I can only imagine what he felt in that moment. I, I personally, I think he felt like he was robbed. Have you ever had part of your life robbed? But God, that's, that's not what should happen to my son. That's, that's not what should have happened to my marriage or my, my career or my, my body. And I know what it is to feel like somehow the life you projected, the life you think you ought to have, sometimes is not there. And I think we can relate to that. And the father came to Jesus, and he said in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, he said, if you can, <laughs> do something. And Jesus replied, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. What Jesus was saying to him was, sir, you had me the moment you brought me your son. You don't have to conjure up a faith that somehow now I'm going to accept that and say, I'll act on your behalf. Oh, we're supposed to mature in our faith. We understand that. But we also serve a God who's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. In church, sometimes the little faith we can offer up seems very small, but Jesus reminds us it's a grain of a mustard seed that can move mountains. It's the smallest of faith that just engages his Lord. You alone do I trust. And so now we come to our story. We, we picture this, and Jesus now takes his disciples away. In verse 30 of chapter 9, says, They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. And he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered to the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he'll rise. Now, if you had the, the paper Bible, you could write in the margin, or you can type on you version 831, because in chapter 8, verse 31, he had already taught them this. In fact, this is the second time that Jesus said, listen, this is who I am. This is what I've come to do. You have to understand why I'm here. He made it clear to them, I've come to not only shape your lives, but I've come to do something that, that is unexpected. I've come to be the sacrifice that you truly can be free. But that's not the God we sign up for sometimes. 
We're not looking for the suffering servant. We're not looking for the suffering savior. If we're honest, and I, I wrote down my list, I want a God that can fix all my problems. In fact, that may be why you came today. You came because you got a problem. Well, he's able, but that's not the main reason he came. He didn't come to put a Band-Aid on our souls just to make us better. He came to die on a cross and offer us a new life, a transformed life, an eternal life that is found in him. I want a God that makes me better, don't you? Oh, God, I'd just like to be a better husband or a better child or a better son or a better employer, whatever the better may be. But again, that's not his primary purpose. Oh, if we're very honest, <laughs> I would say I want God to make me something great. I want to leave a legacy. I want people to know my name. But again, that's not why he came. He made it clear. He made it so clear. He came to sacrifice and serve and be sacrificed for the freedom of everyone who would surrender their lives to him. But yet that is so contrary to what their expectation of a Messiah was to be. Back in the early part of the Bible in Genesis chapter 12, God had made a promise to Abraham. Abraham, if you will follow me, I'll make out of you a great nation. And Abraham had a son named Isaac, and, and Isaac had a son named Jacob, and, and Jacob had 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. You see how it's forming. And a great nation was formed out of Abraham. But in that same chapter, in chapter 12, God said to him, out of this nation will rise up a Savior who will be a blessing to all nations. And literally for centuries they've been waiting. Sometimes we give up after waiting 30 minutes on God. And yet for centuries, they've been waiting. In fact, there had been a period before Jesus came back to earth of 400 years of silence. Can you imagine that? God's like, I'm just not saying anything. <laughs> there, there, there's an anticipation coming, and now Jesus comes on the scene, and he shows up, but he wasn't the type of God they expected. They had amazing expectations, restore Israel, get us back to the glory days. But he said, I've got an ending that you're not going to expect. In fact, Jesus would challenge those closest to him. You think you're following me, but I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure you understand who I am, number one, but I'm also not so sure you know what it means to follow me. And you see this in their response. So here's Jesus laying out what's happening. And in verse 32 it says, but they didn't understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They're silent. They don't know what to say. But instead, what was happening was they were having an argument where they had turned this whole thing, not about Jesus, but to become about them. Because look at verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you guys arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Here's Jesus. I'm going to the cross, guys. And they're like, oh, who's going to be great over here? I wonder what it's going to do for me. How, how are we going to end up in this? And this is where you and I fit into this story. Because again, we can't just look at it and say, oh, those disciples. Because every one of us, if we're truly honest, we struggle with some of the same things. I wrote in my notes, great servants, is that a possibility? See, Jesus is training those closest to him because he knew that post-resurrection, they're going to carry the gospel. We're, we know, because we're going to read the book of Acts, they, they turn the world upside down. But in the moment, you can picture Jesus looking at these guys going, are they ever going to get it? Are they, are they ever going to understand? So he had to break it down really simply. So I'm going to break it down really simply today about what it means to follow Jesus. And the first will be on the screen this morning. I know this is, a, I know this is so deep. Some of y'all are going to write this down. Oh, that's just so deep. Followers follow a leader. Did you know that? Followers follow a leader. That, that, that's the first thing Jesus had to get into their spirit. Followers follow a leader. People ask me, Pastor, what, what's your definition of a leader? I went to school to learn. That. I got a master's degree in ministerial leadership. And I'm like, a leader is someone who has followers. It's that simple. Because there's a lot of people that think they're leading and nobody's following. And they step out one day and they realize, I'm just taking a long walk. But followers follow a leader, and a leader is someone who has followers. I love what Soren Kierkegaard said. It'll be on the screen this morning. It says, it is well known that Christ consistently used the expression follower. He never asked for admirers, worshipers, or adherents. No, he calls disciples. It's not adherents of a teaching, but followers of a life Christ is looking for. 
He's called us to follow his life. So if we understand that followers follow a leader, then we have to also understand that you know you're a follower if you end up where the leader ends up. If I came out to the service today and if we weren't doing on-ramp, maybe I'm going to go have lunch with one of you and say, you might say, well, pastor, just follow me. And if we take off down Johnson Oler Road or Ayler Road, depending on how you pronounce that, and, and we go to Mallard Creek and you take a right and I take a left, there comes a certain point where I have to realize I'm not following you. You get to your destination and I'm in the wrong place. Why? Because I chose my own way. And this is what's happening in the disciples. He's like, guys, this is where I'm going. And they're like, we don't want to go there. We want to know who's going to be greatest. We, we want to understand, God, what's happening around here. Because if you claim that you follow someone, but you don't, then you become your own leader and you end up where you end up. And that's why Jesus said, if we're going to follow him, we've got to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. But they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. They're arguing about the pecking order in the kingdom of God. Here's Jesus telling them, guys, I'm going to die on a cross to free mankind from the curse of sin. But somehow they turned it into, how does this make me great? Let me put it another way. When does following Jesus finally pay off for me? When, when does following Jesus finally pay off for me? If we put it in our modern context, it'd be, God, when do all the prayers, when does all the serving, when does all the sacrifice pay off? I mean, I've been faithful, God. I, I, I'm, on, I'm in church at least two out of the four Sundays a month. God, I, but I still experience things like cancer. I still experience a spouse abandoning me. God, I still experience betrayal by friends or pain. God, when does this Christianity thing pay off? Oh, maybe you've never been there. Maybe you never struggle with that. That's why Jesus had to take them away from the crowd. They had to understand that followers end up where the leader goes. And if we understand that, then in our pain, in our brokenness here on this earth, we recognize he's taking us somewhere, both in this life and the life to come. So what does he do? He has to sit them down in a lesson. In verse 35, it says, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and a servant of all. Now, if we were writing this, we would make it this way. We would say, well, you just have to be toward the end and, and serve those people that actually like you. But no, he said you have to be the very last and servant of all. Not, not just close to the last, the very last and the servant of all. Church, true greatness is never measured by a position or a title. In fact, your position or title is your lowest level of leadership. Well, I'm the boss. Good job. Good job. That's the lowest level you got. No, it's not about title. It's not about recognition. True greatness is a matter to this inward humility of spirit and heart. And we express it by, by serving God and serving others. We express it by serving God, submitting to him to his lordship, and actively serving him by serving his creation, especially the least of these. Well, he still didn't recognize, he recognized they still weren't getting it, so he, he does an object lesson. My wife gets really excited when I ever do object lessons, but I don't have one today, baby, I'm sorry. Object lesson, verse 36. He's like, ah, they're not getting it. So he takes a little child, and he takes a little child, and he places it among them, taking the child in his arms. He said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Now, in our Western mindset, whenever Jesus takes a little child, we're like, oh, how cute. Look at the innocence. Look, look at the vulnerability. In our Western mindset, we totally misread what's taking place in this moment because we think about kids the way we think about kids. But in the Greco-Roman uh, world, at the time of this writing, Jesus was teaching to people who saw kids differently. They were an inconvenience at, at best <laughs> and in the way on the best day. In fact, children were meant to be seen, not heard. They were considered less than your possessions Forgive me, ladies, especially if you were a female. I didn't write that. No, no bad emails, please. Now, sons, sons were another story. 
But even sons weren't really accepted by their fathers until they were about 12 years old, and that was after they'd been raised by somebody else. It's a different picture of a child than we have. We're like, oh, his story's about the innocence and beauty of a child. No, his story was simply this. Jesus takes the very least in the social status and says, if you want to be great, serve them. If you want to be great, serve them. Serve someone like them. Serve someone who can do nothing for you. Serve someone who will not praise you, parents of teenagers. Someone who may not accept your service with gratitude, they may just roll their eyes. But he says, if you want to be great, you look for the least of them and serve them. No, guys, it was so not what the disciples wanted him to say. I mean, we sit back and we hear this discussion going on, and again, we have to say, God, where am I in this? And the reality is we're not any different than the disciples because one of the problems you and I both have is this, and that is we have been taught to be the center of our own universe. We have been taught that, especially in our Western culture. You can do anything. You're great. Go. Participation trophy. You're it. And God says, you want to be it? Be the very last and be the servant of all. You see, in Genesis 3, you and I, mankind, male, female, the, the wonder of God's creation was created, and yet in Genesis 3, they make themselves the center of their own universe. If you go back to Genesis 1, God spoke the word, and the universe came into being. God created the heavens and the earth and all that we need for life. In Genesis 2, he created the greatest part of it. He said it is very good, male and female, because we were recreated with incredible value, incredible purpose. We were to love God and we're to serve each other. It was the perfect marriage. And then in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve were deceived. They took the fruit from Satan, believing it would make them like God. Because if we are God, then why should I have to serve anybody? They should serve me. And it took three chapters. Everything fell apart. And every page following is the chronicle of God's rescue mission of what God has done to invade this earth to buy you and I back, to bring us back into relationship with him and to break the bondage that's been formed over our lives when we try to be our own gods. You recognize that's where most of our problems come from. We gotta be the answer. We gotta be more than that. We gotta be all that, but we're not. We have a God who is great, and we have a God who is worthy, and we have a God who is wonderful, and yet, yet we try to be our own gods, and we, we come to that place where we've made ourselves our own gods, and we're the center of the universe. And when I'm the center of the universe, I truly do have a pronoun problem, because everything's mine. And I look around and I say, God, I'm going to follow my desires. Don't ask me about my sexuality. It's mine. My career choice, my path. God, it's my choice with what I do, with what I earn that shows my bank account on the 1st and the 15th. God, you have nothing to say about that because I get to be the God of my life. You know what that does? It does something so unusual, church. It does something so unexpected. When we live in that place where the center of the universe is us, what it does is this. The word servant becomes a dirty word. It becomes, a, it becomes a four-letter word, so to speak. It becomes a, a dirty word, servant. Yet it's exactly what we are created to be. It's exactly what, what brings us to that place where we're most like God is when we are serving others. It's what we're made for, but now it becomes a, a dirty word. I, I put in my notes, I've, I've, I've lived by this for many, many years. I, I keep it in front of me. Everyone wants to think they're a servant of God until they're actually treated like a servant. And they're like, I'm out. Treat me that way. I'm not, I forget it. But yet God gave us everything and sacrificed for us. You see, servant means a few things. Number one, it means we're not God. Look at your neighbor and say, I know you think it, but you're not God. Would you do that? Just, just y'all are too quiet this morning. Look at your neighbor. I know this is deep, but it, I know it's a strong, but you're not God. Some of you are like, I didn't know that. Well, I'm praying for you, Okay. Number one, you're not God. Servant means you're not always applauded by those you serve. Thank you. You're amazing. I might fall over to hear those words. I don't know. You're not always applauded for who you serve. Servant means, this is going to hurt somebody, servant means my opinion's not always listened to or honored. 
Servant means I don't get to pick the seat next to Jesus in the kingdom, James and John. Now, don't get me wrong. Serving is very culturally applauded. In fact, it's acceptable. We even have this whole category of leadership. We call it servant leadership. And we're okay with that as long as servant is an adjective and not the noun. As long as we're describing a form of leadership, we're okay with that. But the moment we say, nope, you're a servant, oh, forget that. Now it's a dirty word. Because we're missing the understanding. Listen, don't get me wrong. It's good to serve, but the question is, are we servants? Because Jesus is asking us to be like him, and it's contrary to our nature. He says, if I'm the leader, you're following me, you're going to end up where I'm at, then we, we, we become like him. We take on his nature. But truly, if we're honest, we don't want to be anybody's servant. We want to be served. So serving has to be learned, and it has to be strategic. Jesus will tell his disciples what it means to be a servant every time they push back. Oh, here we see Peter in, in, in chapter 8. No, that's, that's not right, Jesus. It's not right. Get behind me, Satan. Now, now he tells them again what it means to be a servant, and they're like, hey, who's going to be the greatest? Later, we're going to see James and John like, who's going to sit on your right? They, it, we don't want to hear it because it goes against our nature. We want our way. We want to be first in all things. But if we say that we follow God who came to serve, suffer, and sacrifice, even to the point of death, then where does that put me as a follower? The whole theme of this series, read from January of, of 2023 until now is this. Oh, God, may our testimony line up with our identity. So if I say I'm a follower, is, is there enough evidence to convict me of that? If I'm a follower, am I going to be like Jesus, who not, did not come to be served, to be a servant to all? We need this story, don't we? We, we need to put ourselves in this story. Because, guys, the good news is this. Each of us are uniquely created to do great things. Each of us. Yes, you, the one that thinks you can't do anything right. You are created to do great things. When God created you, he says, it is very good. And he put gifts in you. He knits you together in your mother's womb, according to Psalm 139. And he says, we've been created to do great things. We have significance. We have impact. Like, Pastor, that kind of goes against servant. No, follow me. It doesn't. Because check it out in Ephesians 2, verse 8. It says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I love that verse. I can look at any one of you and say, you are God's poem. Poem is the word there. You're his master creation. You're his handiwork. He, he knows what he's doing. He, you are his tangible expression of love, and you were created for greatness, and that greatness is expressed in serving. That greatness is expressed in serving. Amen, Pat. That was some good preaching, Pat. I love that point. Man, I'm glad I came today. But how do we know what good is that he's talking about. He's prepared us for good works. How do we know what that is? Is good works helping somebody across the road or not saying what I'm always thinking or, or showing up? Is that good? What, what's the good works? And that's where serving comes in because the next understanding is simply this. Serving is where we discover both our calling and our assignment. Serving is where we discover both our calling and our excitement. Look, no matter what our assignment is in life, if God has made you the best BOA uh, customer service rep there is, then be the best BOA customer service rep. If God has made you to, to be, be the best creative artist, be the best creative artist in town. We all have our assignments. We all have our uniqueness is what we are made to do. But no matter what our assignment may be, we are all called to be servants in every area of our lives. What are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do that unless you're willing to serve. And wherever we miss this, in whatever area of life we get it out of, out of alignment, it leads to brokenness. I'm doing a lot of premarital counseling right now. I love premarital counseling. It's so fun to bust bubbles. It just is. But you take two 
people that are naturally selfish, and if they both want to be served, how many know marriage is a recipe for disaster? But if they truly lay down their lives according to God's word to serve each other, how many know they're going to be the couple sitting on the park bench that you're going to walk by one and they're still holding hands when they're in their 80s and they look like Yoda, but they think they're wonderful. <laughs> I know I've hit a certain age. Denise and I are walking through the mall the other day and a couple stops us. <gasps> What's the secret to a long marriage? I'm like, dude, you tell me I'm old. Well, y'all were holding hands. They don't understand. If I let her go, she may wobble off and fall over somewhere. <laughs> but if you understand it, it's two people that learn to serve each other. That don't just wake up and say, I deserve for you to serve me. Husband, wife. You can apply it to any part of your life, parenting, your job, wherever it may be. Look, we're called to look for opportunities to be like Jesus. And if we're going to be like Jesus, then be like Jesus. And be like him in a manner that serves others no matter who they are. In fact, serve those who don't deserve it. Because how many know sometimes in our relationships, we don't always deserve the service we get. It's not a matter of serving only when they deserve it. No, it's always. My early career when I thought I was going to change the world as a CPA, I know that's really aspirational. I, I, I ran into a pastor, and early we were newlyweds, who said, hey, we got this group of teenagers over here. And I looked at them, and they were a scraggly-looking bunch. And he says, we have nobody to work with them. And he knew I married a pastor's daughter. He's like, surely y'all can work with our youth. And I'm like, oh, dear God, surely not. And yet we volunteered to serve them in a little church called Boone Road Assembly in Houston, Texas. It was in the serving that not only did our assignment become clear, but our absolute recognition that we need the Holy Spirit, we need the Word of God, we need the power of God like never before. Because when you serve, you recognize you're not enough. When you serve, you recognize what you have is not enough. I had nothing to offer those teenagers. Denise was 19. They were calling her ma'am. I mean, come on now. And I'm, I'm all 22. and like, well, how do we get through life? I don't know. We're still trying to figure it out. But I know this. Jesus has to be the center of it all. You see, guys, it's when we serve that we get close to God. It's when we serve that, that God develops in us what truly is great. When he develops in us things like faith and humility. It's in serving that God develops in us things like godly character and wisdom. It's when we serve that God gives us self-control and patience and love. We only discover that when we stop trying to be the greatest and let God speak into us. Because when we serve, we press more into Jesus and we experience more of his Holy Spirit than any other time. That's why when people will say to me, Mike, I've been coming to church my whole life. I just don't experience God the way you talk about. My, like I've been around church. I know the word of God. I, I can quote verses to you, but I've just never experienced the Holy Spirit the way you talk about it. And my only question then is, who are you serving? Not, not where are you serving? Not, hey, I hold the door. I, 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 you know, I hold a baby in the nursery. No, who are you serving? Because until you see yourself as a servant and begin to serve those that, that, that some would look and say, oh, they don't deserve, that's, that's when you experience the work of the Holy Spirit. That's when the Word of God comes alive. That's when all those verses start making sense. Why? Because you recognize something. He's God, we're not, but he put us in the middle of it. He says, I will be with you, I will be in you, and I will work through you, but only, only when you follow me. I dare say a lot of people have been in church many, many years, and someday they're going to stand before Jesus and say, well, how was it? And like, I don't know. Songs were good. Preacher sure we tolerated. People were nice. Well, who'd you serve? Because when you serve, you experience God. When you serve, you experience God. Now, I'm not talking about service like the culture does. Not a once a year volunteer experience. Let's go clean up trash on Earth Day. Good for you. We ought to do that. But that's not serving the least of these. 
I'm not talking a corporate event where you go out and you get the t-shirt and B of A takes a picture and puts you up on the wall to say, we serve our community because we volunteer at Second Harvest once a year. No, that's a photo op. Earlier in ministry, we were out just doing our thing, just feeding the homeless, whatever we could. Now we're getting into the church rolled up one day on, on something we were doing like, oh, great, we got more people with us. This is going to be good. Until the movie cameras came out and the flags, look at us serve. I'm like, you're doing this for Instagram. You're not doing it for Jesus. You're doing this for marketing. You're not doing it for Jesus. Where do you serve the people you live with? Where do you serve your spouse or your kids or your, your marriage, your roommate, your neighbor? That's when it really comes to be. Because when we begin to serve others, we recognize, God, unless you show up, we can't do it. Here, here's the final point. I'm going to give you an example, and that is this. We are never more Christ-like than we are when we are serving. But we are never more anti-Christ when we are expecting to be served. He just called me the Antichrist? Well, sort of. When it's all about me, and I'm living expecting to be served by everyone else, then my attitude and behavior is truly anti-Christ. He said, Pastor, I don't like this. I wasn't raised to, to be a servant. Makes me sound like a doormat. Guys, God never called us to be a doormat. In fact, if you think Jesus was a doormat, go back and read the Gospels. He was full of power and might, passion, character. And yet, because of his meekness, he restrained that all. Why? So they would see God through him. God never asked you to, to lay down your position or your title. He, he's asked you just to serve those who are right in front of you. And we have to ask, ourselves, how do we do that? And the only way I could think to show you is just a couple of quick examples. The first one is out of Ephesians 5. I figured since I'm doing premarital counseling, some of y'all are here today, I would get ahead of myself. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How many know the church can be pretty jacked up? Oh, y'all aren't answering that. No, we're perfect. We're the perfect church. Been doing this 36 years, people. I know better. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives. They love their own bodies. Who, he who loves his wife loves himself. You know what the report card of my life is? It's her smile that is my report card. Because I've had 38 years to serve her. Do I do it perfectly? Don't, amen. No. No. But serving her means I'll do whatever I can to add value to her life. Serving means I'll choose to lose the arguments because it's not worth arguing over. Serving her means instead of picking at the little things that are not perfect in her life, and I know that's hard to believe because she's perfect, instead, I will focus on everything that makes her God's beautiful creation. And if I serve her, then what it means is I laid down my life, my outcomes, my desires, so that she may become everything God wants her to be. Because she's his creation. You know what the outcome is? Then she's more beautiful today than ever. It's more beautiful today than ever. But if all I do is find fault, point out her flaws, believe that I'm the one that should be served, then I tell you there's no beauty in this relationship. Oh, the Bible says she's to respect me, not because I deserve it, not that I've earned it, but yet that, that builds me up because <laughs> we have ego problems, men. And God gives us that beautiful helpmate to come. Kids, serve your kids. Deuteronomy 6 says, you're the parent, not the youth pastor. Newsflash. Preach. Serve them. What does that mean? Do more for them than they will ever do for you. Well, I brought them into this world. They, they should serve me. You're missing the point. 
Now, I do tell my kids when I get old, I am living with them and making their life miserable, but that's a whole other story. What about your possessions, your talents, your gifts? It's back to that pronoun issue, my, my, mine. One day, we will be judged for what God entrusted to us. One day, we will be judged. For what we, God, did we use it to serve others? Or did we do it just to do something cool on this earth? How about your job, your career? <laughs> I recognize that God has sent people alongside of me to serve this church. I don't always do it perfectly, but I need to do more for them than I expect them to do for me. I want to help make their lives better because serving the Lord is not a drudgery. It's an, it's an opportunity. It's a blessing. I pray every day, God, I can't believe I get to do this. But church, you know you got the serving thing down when you say, God, I can't believe I get to do this. I get to serve someone else. God, because they're made in the image of you and they have infinite value and infinite worth. You see, God never asked me to lay down title and position. He just asked me to redefine what it means. What does it mean? You see, serving isn't extracurricular activity. It doesn't get us extra credit in heaven. Serving's at the very core of a definition of what it means to be a Christian. So church, who are you serving? Not where are you serving? This is not, a, this is not a recruitment sermon. Oh, we need people in the nursery. No. We do have nine babies on the way, just saying. What I'm saying is this. Disciples, Jesus, make us great. He said, look around then. Who do you think doesn't deserve it? Serve them. Look around them. Who does culture demean? Serve them. Look around you. Who do you overlook? Serve them. The proof's not going to be a serving event. The proof's going to be a day by day, moment by moment. And those that are closest to you will be the ones that say, yes, good job. And you may not get applause on earth, but guess what? One day we'll stand before our Father in heaven, and I only want to hear one phrase. Well done good and faithful worshiper. Well done, good and faithful adherent. Well done, good and faithful preacher. Well done, good and faithful father today. Help.